All right, thank you very much. I find myself in a tough spot because I'm the only thing between now and lunch. So I will try to not waste too much time. So today we're going to be talking about blowing up the monolith and modernizing architectures. My name is Marco Palladino, and I'm the co-founder and CTO of Com. Transitioning away from the monolith, it's a path in modernizing our enterprise, our systems. It's a transformation that doesn't just impact the technology we're using, but also impacts our teams and the operational processes we are in place to make that happen. So it's about transitioning our enterprise from, I like to say, a complex organism from a single cell to a multicellular organism. Different teams, different products, different business concerns, different business cases for each one of those teams that have to work together, connected together. Blowing up the model is fundamentally moving away from large components and large teams into smaller services, into smaller teams. Our teams are becoming as decoupled and as distributed as our services. It's a journey. It's a journey that goes from traditional legacy monolith to more and more decoupled systems. We want to enable different teams and different products to communicate with each other. We want to be able to scale them independently, to deploy and build them independently. And the traditional API use case, you know, APIs were very popular as a north-south in north-south traffic. Now they evolve and they change. APIs evolve and change because APIs are the enabler to this transformation. You know, data can be in three different stages. Data can be at rest, like it was in the monolith. It can be in use, or it can be in flight. And as we blow up the monolith, that information is going to be more and more in flight between one service to another, between one cloud and another. From monolith to services. And some of those services will have to be hyperscale, and some of them will transition to microservices. And perhaps we're going to be having teams and pockets of adoption of either new modern technologies like serverless or function as a service. When we approach any transition in the organization, we really have to pay attention to what's the underlying business case that's driving this transformation. You know, transitioning from monolith to microservices, it's not something new that has been happening just for the past five years. Organizations like Amazon and Netflix have done it a long time ago. Netflix was expanding from one country, one device, a limited set of clients, to more countries, to all over the world, to having a lot of those clients. Therefore, the architecture that was working well for them in a simpler business case had to evolve to enable a business transformation. At the end of the day, we are transitioning away our software to unlock that business requirement. So it's very important that in this transformation, from monolith to microservices, we are very pragmatic into understanding why we're doing it. Refactoring a monolith is an activity that unlocks team productivity and business scalability. If the transformation we're doing does not do that, it means we're failing at it. The keywords here are team productivity and business scalability. We are blowing up the monolith because we want to make our teams more productive. We want them to be able to create products faster. We want them to be able to innovate faster. And as a result to that, we want to unlock new business cases for our business. We want to be able to increase and scale the business, which ultimately is the driver to this transformation. If the changes we're going to be doing are not within 
this purpose, then it's an academic project. It's not a business project. So in a very pragmatic way, we have to look at what we have today, find the painful points that today are hurting the organization, the teams, the business, and then take those out first, and then take the second ones first, and then so on. As we transition from, away from the monolith, one of the questions I like to ask to the, you know, to the enterprise architects I work with is, should you do it? And so this is the first question that really should start and should happen first and foremost before even writing any line of code. Should we transition away from the monolith? Transitioning away from the monolith, it's not um, a simple process. It's a complex process. And we should be paying lots of attention into not falling into the mistake of following hypes and following what other architects are doing. But always tie our activity with, again, the pragmatism of the reality we're working in. Moving to microservices and moving away from monoliths, they obviously bring lots of advantages. But one of the things that they bring is that we're increasing the complexity of our systems. Microservices, it's an all of n problem. We have many of those services that now, as opposed to a monolith, we have to scale, we have to deploy, we have to extend. If the teams today are having problems and trouble keeping a simple monolith operational, running, functional, well, those teams are going to be struggling even more with microservices because microservices really add to that complexity. It's not one system anymore. It's hundreds, thousands of those systems. So any team who's approaching this transition really has to look at what tooling and what processes they have today to make sure, are we ready to make this transition? And this is a transition that's not going to happen overnight. Is the leadership on board with this transformation? Again, it's not just a technical transformation. It's an organizational transformation. The teams will have to be decoupled and distributed like our systems. And of course, we can see how this scale, once we unlock this Pandora box, can, can increase. And this can bring lots of advantages, but also can be terribly, terribly daunting for any team who's not ready for this transition. So preparing ourselves for the transition is step number one. Understanding what the business requires it's the starting point. But if we do find out that we need to do it, we need to blow up the monolith, we need to scale our systems, then we can approach the transition. There are three different strategies that we can adopt for blowing up the monolith. One of them I call the ice cream scoop strategy. Imagine having a large box of ice cream and we're scooping out from that box individual components, individual services that now can be deployed, built, scaled separately. Then there is what I call the Lego strategy. We have this huge piece of Lego, which is our monolith, and that monolith, it's too complicated to transition, or maybe there is no reason to transition it. So we're going to be building new services and new products around these monoliths, the legacy monoliths, but the new ones, this greenfield development, will be built in a decoupled way. And then there is the third, the nuclear strategy. And my advice to you is to never go nuclear. Nuclear means that we are going to be stopping work on the monolith. We put the monolith in a maintenance phase. And then we rewrite the entire thing in microservices. Only teams that are extremely organized and they can pinpoint down the actual scope of the work will be successful with a nuclear strategy. Most likely, the organization will now have two different products, two different teams. Nobody wants to work on legacy. All the new features will be built in the new one, but the new one, it's not ready yet. And we end up in a situation where the business, instead of being helped by this transition, it's being harmed by this transition. So today, I'm going to be looking at the ice cream, scream, uh, the ice cream scoop strategy. So this is a typical monolith. It's an object-oriented monolith. 
Uh, we have many objects, we have many classes within our monolith, and they all communicate via each other, via function calls. We can make the assumption that this is an hypothetical marketplace. Think of a marketplace like Amazon.com. So we have a search functionality, we have inventory, we have the checkout process, we have the review process, we have the users, the offers, and so on. Each one of these concerns, over time, have been built within the same code base. So over time, this code base became extremely large and painful to maintain. And the business is suffering. We have to do something. So we identify different teams working on this monolith. And so, for example, the search, inventory, and items in review part is a part of our monolith which requires frequent, frequent the redeployments. It's a, it's a friction point because the team, team number two, which is now working on that part, is making lots of changes. And those changes have to be run in production, and that requires lots of coordinations with the other teams. So in a very, in a very pragmatic way, we decide to extract that. As you can see, we don't extract the entire thing at once. We extract it gradually. We are looking at what the business requires today, and then we make that decision. So now team two is, is extracting that monolith, and it's separating the data store between the two different components. The data stores have to be separate, because one of the principles of decoupling our systems is that we don't want them to we don't want one of them to being able to break down the other. We want to isolate them for as much as we can. So in a microservice rented architecture, every service will have a different data store. That obviously introduces a new challenges. How do we make sure that the state is consistent across all of these different microservices? And some of these challenges, it's very hard to give a one-fit-all answer. It really depends on what is your system doing and we can use events to propagate some of those state changes, or we can implement APIs that keep the state consistent. It's very hard to say a one-fit-all answer. We have to look pragmatically at what the application does today. But even here, within this new microservice, which is kind of large, there's a bunch of stuff still in there, there is a problem. The team is having lots of trouble scaling one of these functions, and so they go ahead and they separate it again. The key word here is to be pragmatic. Let's look at exactly what is the maximum pain point we have today, and let's extract it gradually. This has two advantages. Number one, the teams are not doing too much all at once. But number two, we are also gradually having business results that validate our roadmap. Also, as the team gradually extracts all of these different services, the teams themselves get more confidence they can do it. And they're able to sort out and figure out all the operational and organizational problems that perhaps go even beyond the actual technology adoption or technology transition. Well, now we have different systems. Now we have the legacy monolith now we have these new services, and then we have that search microservice. Obviously, we want to have clients consuming the systems, and so we'll have to figure out a way to route that, that traffic. Now, before we move forward to the transition, it's important to consider that this is really a refactoring. Transitioning to microservices and blowing up the legacy monolith, it's a refactoring of our code base. That's what it is. And like any refactoring, we have to have a clear understanding of what our code does. Sometimes the monolith, it's so legacy that has been written by who knows who, who knows when, and we have a problem into understanding, into even approaching the transition, because we don't know what the monolith does. And because the, we don't know what the monolith does, we don't know what are the clients that can be potentially affected by this transition. So we have to get the clear picture of what we're refactoring and then testing it. Integration tests that can validate that the behavior we have today, it's not broken as we're done with our extractions. And this sounds so basic, but you would be surprised how many teams, like John Wayne, going in there, decoupling their monoliths into microservices, 
and missing out these basic principles. We cannot rush the transition. It's not going to be an easy transition and it's not going to happen overnight. And that's the expectation really we have to set within ourselves, within the teams, within the customers and the leadership. So once we are decoupling our software, it's important at that point to understand how can we reroute the requests that used to be going just to the monolith to these new different components. So we have to have a smart load balancer and a way of implementing a smart load balancer is to have an API gateway. An API gateway is able to understand who the clients are and then reroute traffic based on whatever properties like routes or domain names or perhaps even user agent to different components of the monolith and the future next-gen microservice-oriented architecture. In order for this to be effective, we have to have the API gateway since day one. So we want to introduce this intelligent layer before we start the refactoring so that the API gateway becomes the entry point to our requests. And because it becomes the entry point, it can be an abstraction layer when then under the hood we have to make those changes. So now we can approach the transition, we can decouple our systems, and then have the API gateway or a very intelligent load balancer being able to, to handle the rerouting of our client requests in the monolith. The idea here is that as we're making this transition, we really do not want to break down those clients. And then we can keep going on and on and releasing new versions of our microservices and implement perhaps modern strategies like canary releases or blue-green deployments, which allows us to redirect just a percentage of traffic to a new version of our microservice, for example, to make sure that it works. Or another, which I'm a big fan of, would be to duplicate the traffic so that a subset of the production traffic is being duplicated into our staging environment so that our staging environments, they can run with the same data that it's running in production, or a subset of it, at least. As we're making this transition, I would like to add a note. And the note is about hybrid platforms and multi-cloud. There are two ways to approach this. One way is to It's to decide since day one to, de to use different platforms and different clouds. But most likely, this is not a top-down decision. This is what will happen naturally in the enterprise. Now, we said before when I started this presentation that the enterprise, it's a multicellular organism. That means we are going to be having different teams and different products that naturally make the right decisions for whatever business case and end user they're trying to work with. And so these different teams might decide to use different clouds, or perhaps the organization makes acquisitions, and the teams and the products it acquires are running on different clouds. The enterprise becomes multi-cloud and becomes a hybrid, not necessarily because it wants to, but because it has to. All of these different teams and all of these different products, over time, will naturally use whatever cloud or whatever service within those clouds gives them the best capabilities to be successful in production. So the enterprise must have a multi-cloud and hybrid strategy because most likely it is already a multi-cloud and hybrid reality. And then it comes to sizing our services. So we have our monolith and we want to decouple and extract our services. And one of the questions that I hear from uh, you know, enterprise architects as they go into this process is, you know, but how big should these new services be? And the, real, and the, the answer to this, it's, uh, it's very pragmatic again. We should never forget to be pragmatic. And the answer is, they should be of whatever size we think they are. So this is an ideal world. You know, when we look at microservices, we always see these sort of pictures of you know, all these perfectly sized services, but the pragmatism will lead us to having something like this, most likely. Our services will be as big as the business logic, as the domain logic we want to extract into different services. No more, no less than that. And if the microservice is too big, that's not a big deal. 
we can still decouple it even further as we need to do so. It's always easier to decouple even further. It becomes harder to put them back together. Obviously, there is no transition to microservices without considering the new importance of a reliable network within our systems. In a monolith, um, we have objects, like I showed you before, but really these objects in these different classes are talking to each other via function calls. We make a function call to create a new invoice. We make a function call to trigger a new transaction, transaction billing transaction. And the assumption we have, for example, if it's in Java, we have the assumption that these functions will always succeed. The actual function will reach the destination class. Well, now in microservices, we cannot make that assumption anymore because we are removing our objects with independent services that are being deployed in their own processes, and they communicate with each other via an API, an interface of some sort, and the network. Now, the network, it's one of the biggest problems we'll have to deal with in a microservice-oriented architecture, because as we all know, the network is unreliable. The network can be slow, can be fast, can be inactive for a period of times, can be a huge variable in our performance. In performance, it's a first-class citizen in a microservice rental architecture. If it takes too much to make all the requests we have to make, the end user will be affected by that. And eventually, we're going to be having a business problem because users will leave and stop using our product. So typical network problems are, for example, the latency. How do we make sure, how do we deal with slow networks and uh, unreliable networks? How do we deal with security? How do we protect all the communication across these functions? In a monolith, we did not have any of these concerns, or we didn't have most of them, because the actual, for example, underlying Java virtual machine would take care of most of this. So security, routing, error handling, observability. Now we have so many moving parts. We have to collect metrics to understand what each part is doing and how we can debug problems very easily. So one of the answers to this is to introduce a service mesh. A service mesh is a mesh of networks that allows us to, to, to make the network reliable again by using a proxy, an out-of-process proxy, which makes sure that the network is reliable, that the security is being enforced, that we can get observability metrics out of it. These proxies are data planes on the execution path of every API request that goes from one service to another service. Because the data planes are doing this for us, we don't have to build this in our applications. The teams that are building the microservices, they can keep focusing on the business logic of their microservice and delegate all of these network problem and question mark to the data plane proxy. The data plane proxy is an L4 proxy, so it really works on the TCP layer and can or cannot, depending on the technology, also have L7 features on top of it. So the biggest assumption and the reason why data plane proxies are being used in a service mesh is because the assumption we're making is that the proxy is going to be running on the same underlying virtual machine as our service, which means that the communication between the service and the proxy, the outgoing request, always happen on localhost, and therefore, should technically always succeed. That's why the data planes sometimes are called sidecar proxies. Sidecar, it's a Kubernetes-specific way of saying, deploy this proxy on the same underlying virtual machine where the microservice is running. But service meshes, obviously, you know, Kubernetes makes it easier in certain ways, but service meshes are platform agnostic. We can build service meshes in any platform, including bare metal. We, do, we are not limited to Kubernetes. Kubernetes does, you know, uh, figures out some of the things we'll have to build in a bare metal infrastructure, but obviously service mesh as a pattern can work pretty much anywhere. As a matter of fact, you could have hybrid service meshes on Kubernetes and bare metal. And we're going to be having an instance of the proxy for every instance of the service, because if one of those proxies fail, we don't want that one proxy to be affecting other instances of our service. We want to decouple as much as we can. Obviously, because we're going to be having an instance of the sidecar proxy for every instance 
of our services, we'll have to make sure the memory footprint is very low. And then we're going to be having a control plane, because now we have so many data planes being running uh, in our systems that we have to have something that allows us to centralize the configuration and then push that configuration to the data planes. And that system is called the control plane. The control plane is the single pane glass which allows us to configure our sidecar proxies and the security and the observability within our systems. The API gateway becomes yet another data plane that happens to be at the edge, that happens to be dealing with requests of our external clients. Simple as that. And to terminate my presentation, you know, I like to make analogies. We said before, enterprise organizations and enterprise systems are becoming multicellular, complex organisms. So I like to make an analogy of the control plane and data plane using our human body. We do have a nervous system. Each one of us has it. And our nervous system is made of two different parts, a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system in our body, in our fingers, in our arms the central one being in our brain. It's akin to having a control plane that receives and instructs information to those perif peripheral data planes, like a nervous system. So I'm the CTO of Kong, and really what we're building is the nervous system of the cloud. So we provide both the control plane that can run on these open source data planes, like Kong, like Nginx, as well as Envoy, very soon. So to recap, as we approach the, trans the transition from monoliths to microservices, we really have to understand what is the business transformation we're trying to achieve. Everything that we do has to reconnect to the actual business case and how we can increase and deliver our business. That's what every organization who has been successful with microservices has done. Netflix, Amazon, everybody, Google. We have to be pragmatic. Okay, now that we know what we're trying to achieve, how can we unlock the business? What are the next steps? Let's go find the most painful parts of our systems and decouple those first. Let's be pragmatic. Pragmatic is really the key word of this transformation. If we're not pragmatic, this thing tur can turn very well, very easily into an academic project that doesn't deliver business value. It's important to always tie this transformation with the business value we're trying to create, as well as adopting modern technologies. This is going to be a transformation that can run on multiple platforms, that can run on hybrid clouds, that has to support different architectures, has to support the old monolith still, as well as supporting modern microservices and service mesh oriented architectures. Whatever technology we're using to enable this transition has to be capable of enabling the transition. That's why it's important to pick the right technologies to make this happen. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Marco. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes, here. Hi. Could you grab? Yeah, sorry. It's here. No questions for Marco? There are, I, I guess I have, I, I have a number of things to, um, that, that, that I, I'm, I'm interested in about microservices because th th this is a, a multi-step journey. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, I think uh, you, you sort of talked about um, early on well, where are the pain points and where, where should you stand. But what, um, what do you recommend in terms of um, the initial landscape Review, reviewing uh, an enterprise's existing landscape um, and seeing well, wh where are the opportunities for, for that. Yeah. You know, I really like to reconnect the analysis that we're making before approaching the transition to really, uh, this is a conversation that cannot be too low level and close to the metal. It has to be a little bit more higher. So the actual engineers have to really communicate 
what they believe it's the biggest bottleneck and the business has also to communicate that and then in agreement the leadership and the engineers making the work will have to find out what's the starting point what is the best thing the team can do today to approach this transition while delivering a business value immediately you know as the first step as the first goal that makes everybody's confident that we can keep moving forward. So it's really, okay, what's hurting the business today? Mm -hmm. But you know, the engineers, usually they're not necessarily aware of those high level strategic roadmaps of the organization. Mm -hmm. So that really has to happen simultaneously from a, a technical standpoint, but also a business standpoint. Really, business and tech have to match in order to find what's the best starting point. Yeah. So the analysis, the, most of the time for the initial analysis, in my opinion, will be spent understanding what's the first thing to extract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, great. Time for one more question. Yes. We are talking about sizing of uh, services. So in the actual, we find out there will be some services in big in size and some which have say, small functions. So the big size uh, services can be decoupled into small services, internal services. Is it? Correct, and the architecture point of view? Co correct, so the point of sizing is that we have to size them not based on an idea that we have of, you know, we want them to be of the same size or too small, but we want to size them accordingly over time, right? The risks of sizing too small too soon is that we're introducing lots of operational complexity that end up not being useful for the actual mission that we're trying to, you know, uh, that we're onboarding. So let's size them of the right size for fixing the current problem today. And then once we have done that, let's learn from that experience. And then we can always resize further and further, right? We don't have to do too much too soon because that's a recipe for disaster. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thanks Thank very you. much, Marco.